Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Classic Tales live reading of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. I am your narrator, Libba Beecham, here at the Northeast Georgia History Center's Cottrell Digital Studio. And today we are on part 10, so we are well into our story. So if you're just joining us, I do recommend that you go back to part one on our YouTube channel. You can also find those videos on our Facebook videos tab. Um, just a warning, we will need to end about 10 minutes early today because we have to set up for a pretty exciting program uh, later today at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Historian Glenn Kyle is going to present Weapons Through the Ages. So this is going to be, uh, fingers crossed, an outdoor <laughs> event so that he can demonstrate various, uh, basically the evolution of weapons um, from over hundreds of years, I'm sure. So. Please uh, join us for that at 2 p.m. today, but we will need to end a little bit early. So uh, let's get started. We are on, let's see, what chapter is this? I believe it's chapter nine of part two. Yes, okay, a vanished continent. So I'm just gonna check our audio before we get started. Let's see. So. All right, great, sounding good. And thank you, Charlie, for that uh, compliment. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate uh, all of you being here for these live stream programs. All right. A Vanished Continent. The next morning, the 19th of February, I saw the Canadian enter my room. I expected this visit. He looked very disappointed. Well, sir, said he. Well, Ned, fortune was against us yesterday. Yes, that captain must needs stop exactly at the hour we intended leaving this vessel. Yes, Ned, he had business at his bankers. His bankers? Or rather, his banking house. By that I mean the ocean, where his riches are safer than in the chests of the state. I then related to the Canadian the incidents of the preceding night, hoping to bring him back to the idea of not abandoning the captain, but my recital had no other result than an energetically expressed regret from Ned that he had not been able to take a walk on the battlefield of Vigo on his own account. However, he said, all is not ended. It is only a blow of the harpoon lost. Another time we must succeed, and tonight, if necessary, in what direction is the Nautilus going? I asked. I do not know, replied Ned. Well, at noon we shall see the point. The Canadian returned to conceal. As soon as I was dressed, I went into the saloon. The compass was not reassuring. The course of the Nautilus was south by southwest. We were turning our backs on Europe. I waited with some impatience till the chi ship's place was pricked on the chart. At about half past 11, the reservoirs were empty and our vessel rose to the surface of the ocean. I rushed towards the platform. Ned Land had preceded me. No more land in sight, nothing but an immense sea. Some sails on the horizon, doubtless those going to San Roque, in search of favorable winds for doubling the Cape of Good Hope. The weather was cloudy. A gale of wind was preparing. Ned raved and tried to pierce the cloudy horizon. He still hoped that behind all that fog stretched the land he so longed for, at noon, the sun showed itself for an instant. The second profited by this brightness to take its height. Then, the sea becoming more billowy, we descended and the panel closed. An hour after, upon consulting the chart, I saw the position of the Nautilus was marked at 16 degrees and 17 degrees longitude and 32, 33 and 22 latitude at 150 leagues from the nearest coast. There was no means of flight, and I leave you to imagine the rage of the Canadian when I informed him of our situation. For myself, I was not particularly sorry. I felt lightened of the load which had oppressed me and was able to return with some degree of calmness to my accustomed work. That night, about 11 o'clock, I received a most unexpected visit from Captain Nemo. He asked me very graciously if I felt fatigued from my watch of the preceding night. I answered in the negative. Then, Monsieur Aranax, I propose a curious excursion. Propose, Captain. You have hitherto only visited the submarine depths by daylight, under the brightness of the sun. Would it suit you to see them in the darkness of the night? Most willingly. I warn you, the way will be tiring. We shall have far to walk and must climb a mountain. The roads are not well kept. What you say, Captain, only heightens my curiosity. I am ready to follow you. Come then, sir, we will put on our diving dresses. 
Arrived at the robing room, I saw that neither of my companions nor any of the ship's crew were to follow us on this excursion. Captain Nemo had not even proposed my taking with me either Ned or Conceal. In a few moments, we had put on our diving dresses. They placed on our backs the reservoirs abundantly filled with air, but no electric lamps were prepared. I called the captain's attention to the fact. They will be useless, he replied. I thought I had not heard right, but I could not repeat my observation, for the captain's head had already disappeared in its metal case. I finished harnessing myself. I felt them put on iron-pointed stick. I felt them put an iron-pointed stick into my hand, and some minutes later, after going through the usual form, we set foot on the bottom of the Atlantic at a depth of 150 fathoms. Midnight was near. The waters were profoundly dark, but Captain Nemo pointed out in the distance a reddish spot, a sort of large light shining brilliantly about two miles from the Nautilus. What this fire might be, what could feed it, why and how it lit up the liquid mass, I could not say. In any case, it did light our way, vaguely, it is true, but I soon accustomed myself to the peculiar darkness, and I understood, under such circumstances, the uselessness of the Rumkorf apparatus. As we advanced, I heard a kind of pattering above my head, the noise redoubling, sometimes producing a continual shower. I soon understood the cause. It was rain falling violently and crisping the surface of the new waves. Indistinct, instinctively, the thought flashed across my mind that I should be wet through by the water, in the midst of the water. I could not help laughing at the odd idea, but indeed the thick diving dress, the liquid element, is no longer felt, and one only seems to be in an atmosphere somewhat denser than the terrestrial atmosphere, nothing more. After half an hour's walk, the soil became stony. Medusae, microscopic crustacea, and penetules lit it slightly with their phosphorescent gleam. I caught a glimpse of pieces of stone covered with millions of zoophytes and masses of seaweed. My feet often slipped upon the sticky carpet of seaweed, and without my iron-tipped stick I should have fallen more than once. In turning round I could see still the whitish lantern of the Nautilus beginning to pale in the distance. But the rosy light which guided us increased and lit up the horizon. The presence of this fire under water puzzled me in the highest degree. Was I going towards a natural phenomenon as yet unknown to the savants of the earth? Or even, for this thought crossed my brain, had the hand of man ought to do with this conflagra conflagration? Had he fanned this flame, was I to meet in these depths companions and friends of Captain Nemo, whom he was going to visit, and who, like him, led this strange existence? Should I find down there a whole colony of exiles who, wary of the miseries of this earth, had sought and found independence in the deep ocean? All these foolish and unreasonable ideas pursued me, and in this condition of mind, overexcited by the succession of wonders continually passing before my eyes, I should not have been surprised to meet at the bottom of the sea one of those submarine towns of which Captain Nemo dreamed. Our road grew lighter and lighter. The white glimmer came in rays from the summit of a mountain about 800 feet high. But what I saw was simply a reflection developed by the clearness of the waters. The source of this inexplicable light was a fire on the opposite side of the mountain. In the midst of this stony maze furrowing the bottom of the Atlantic, Captain Nemo advanced without hesitation. He knew this dreary road. Doubtless, he had often traveled over it and could not lose himself. I followed him with unshaken confidence. He seemed to me like a genie of the sea, and as he walked before me, I could not help admiring his stature, which was outlined in black on the luminous horizon. It was one in the morning when we arrived at the first slopes of the mountain, but to gain access to them, we must venture through the difficult paths of a vast copse. Copse. Let's find out what that word means. A copse, copse, okay, it is copse, a small group of trees, all right, a vast copse, <laughs> yes, a copse of dead trees, without leaves, without sap, trees petrified by the action of the water and here and there, overtopped by gigantic pines. It was like a coal pit still standing, holding by the roots to the broken soil, and whose branches, like fine black paper cuttings, showed distinctively on the water ceiling. 
Picture to yourself a forest in the hearts hanging on to the sides of the mountain, but a forest swallowed up. The paths were encumbered with seaweed and fucus, between which groveled a whole world of crustacea. I went along, climbing the rocks, striding over extended trunks, breaking the sea-bind weed which hung from one tree to the other, and frightening the fishes which flew from branch to branch. Pressing onward, I felt no fatigue. I followed my guide, who was never tired. What a spectacle! How can I express it? How paint the aspect of those woods and rocks in this medium? Their underparts dark and wild, the upper colored with red tints, by that light which the reflecting powers of the waters doubled. We climbed rocks which fell directly after the gigantic bounds and the low growling of an avalanche. To right and left ran long, dark galleries where sight was lost. Here opened vast glades which the hand of man seemed to have worked, and I sometimes asked myself if some inhabitant of these submarine regions would not suddenly appear to me. But Captain Nemo was still mounting. I could not stay behind. I followed boldly. My stick gave me good help. A false step would have been dangerous in the narrow passes sloping down to the sides of the gulfs. But I watched with firm step, without feeling any giddiness. Now I jumped a crevice, the depth of which would have made me hesitate had it been among the glaciers on the land. Now I ventured on the unsteady trunk of a tree thrown across from one abyss to the other, without looking under my feet, having only eyes to admire the wild sights of this region. There, monumental rocks, leaning on their regularly cut bases, seemed to defy all laws of equilibrium. From between their stony knees, trees sprang, like a jet under heavy pressure, and upheld others which upheld them. Natural towers, large scarps, cut pen uh, perpendicularly, like a curtain, inclined at an angle which the laws of gravitation could never have tolerated in terrestrial regions. Two hours after quitting the Nautilus, we had crossed the line of trees, and a hundred feet above our heads rose the top of the mountain, which cast a shadow on the brilliant ir irradiation of the opposite slope. Some petrified shrubs ran fantastically here and there. Fishes got up under our feet like birds in the long grass. The massive rocks were rent with impenetrable fractures, deep grottoes, and unfathomable holes, at the bottom of which formidable creatures might be heard moving. My blood curdled when I saw enormous antennae blocking my road or some frightful claw closing with a noise in the shadow of some cavity. Millions of luminous spots shone brightly in the midst of the darkness. They were the eyes of giant crustacea crouched in their holes, giant lobsters setting themselves up like halb halber halberdiers and moving their claws with clicking sound of pincers. Titanic crabs pointed like a gun in its carriage, and frightful-looking uh, pulps interweaving their tentacles like a living nest of serpents. We had now arrived on the first platform, where other surprises awaited me. Before us lay some picturesque ruins which betrayed the hand of man and not that of the Creator. There were vast heaps of stone, amongst which might be traced the vague and shadowy forms of castles and temples, clothed with a world of blossoming zoophytes, and over which, instead of ivy, seaweed, and fucus, threw a thick vegetable mantle. But what was this portion of the globe which had been swallowed by cataclysms? Who had placed those stones and rocks like crumblecks of prehistoric times? Where was I? Whither had Captain Nemo's fancy hurried me? I would fain have asked him, not being able to, I stopped him, I seized his arm, but shaking his head and pointing to the highest point of the mountain, he seemed to say, come, come along, come higher. I followed him, and in a few minutes I had climbed to the top, which for a circle of ten yards commanded the whole mass of rock. I looked down the side we had just climbed. The mountain did not rise more than seven or eight hundred feet above the level of the plain, but on the opposite side it commanded from twice that height the depths of this part of the Atlantic. My eyes ranged far over a large space lit by a violent ful fulguration. In fact, the mountain was a volcano. At fifty feet above the peak in the midst of the rain of stones and scoriae, 
A large crater was vomiting forth torrents of lava which fell in a cascade of fire into the bosom of the liquid mass. Thus situated, this volcano lit the lower plain like an immense torch, even to the extreme limits of the horizon. I said that submarine crater threw up lava, but no flames. Flames require the oxygen of the air to feed upon and cannot be developed underwater. But streams of lava, having in themselves the principles of their incandescence, can attain a white heat, fight vigorously against the liquid element, and turn it to vapor by contact. Rapid currents, bearing all these gases and diffusion and torrents of lava slid to the bottom of the mountain like an eruption of Vesuvius on another Terra del Greco. There indeed, under my eyes, ruined, destroyed, lay a town, its roofs open to the sky, its temples fallen, its arches dislocated, its columns lying on the ground from which one would still recognize the massive character of Tuscan architecture. Further on, some remains of a gigantic aqueduct, here the high base of an acropolis, with the floating outline of a Parthenon, there traces of a quay, as if an ancient port had formerly abutted on the borders of the ocean, and disappeared with its merchant vessels and its war, war galleys. Farther on again, long lines of sunken walls and broad deserted streets, a perfect Pompeii escaped beneath the waters. Such was the sight that Captain Nemo brought before my eyes. Where was I? Where was I? I must know at any cost. I tried to speak, but Captain Nemo stopped me by a gesture, and picking up a piece of chalk stone, advanced to a rock of black basalt and traced the one word, Atlantis. What a light shot through my mind! Atlantis! The Atlantis of Plato, that continent denied by Origen and Humboldt, who placed its disappearance amongst the legendary tales. I had it there now before my eyes, bearing upon it the unexceptionable testimony of its catastrophe. The region thus engulfed was beyond Europe, Asia, and Libya, beyond the columns of Hercules, where those powerful people, the Atlantides, lived, against whom the first wars of ancient Greeks were waged. Thus, led by the strangest destiny, I was treading underfoot the mountains of this continent, touching with my hand those ruins a thousand generations old and contemporary with the geological epochs. I was walking on the very spot where the contemporaries of the first man had walked. Whilst I was trying to fix in my mind every detail of this grand landscape, Captain Nemo remained motionless, as if petrified in mute ecstasy, leaning on a mossy stone. Was he dreaming of those generations long since disappeared? Was he asking them the secret of human destiny? Was it here the strange man came to steep himself in historical recollections and live again this ancient life, he who wanted no modern one? What would I not have given to know his thoughts, to share them, to understand them? We remained for an hour at this place, contemplating the vast plains under the brightness of the lava, which was sometimes wonderfully intense. Rapid tremblings ran along the mountain caused by internal bubblings, deep noise distinctively transmitted through the liquid medium were echoed with majestic grandeur. At this moment, the moon appeared through the mass of waters and threw her pale rays on the buried continent. It was but a gleam, but what an indescribable effect. The captain rose, cast one look on the immense plain, and then bade me follow him. We descended the mountain rapidly, and the mineral forest once passed, I saw the lantern of the Nautilus shining like a star. The captain walked straight to it, and we got on board at the first rays of the, white, of the light whitened the surface of the ocean. Chapter 10. The Submarine Coal Mines The next day, the 20th of February, I awoke very late. The fatigues of the previous night had prolonged my sleep until 11 o'clock. I dressed quickly and hastened to find the course of the Nautilus was taking. The instrument showed it to be still toward the south, with a speed of 20 miles an hour and a depth of 50 fathoms. The species of fishes here did not differ much from those already noticed. 
There were rays of giant size, five yards long, and endowed with great muscular strength, which enabled them to shoot above the waves. Sharks of many kinds, amongst others, one 15 feet long, with triangular sharp teeth and those transparency rendered it almost invisible in the water. Amongst bony fish, Conceal noticed some about three yards long, armed at the upper jaw with a piercing sword, other bright-colored creatures known in the time of Aristotle by the name of the sea dragon, which are dangerous to capture on account of the spikes on their back. About four o'clock, the soil generally, generally composed of a thick mud mixed with petrified wood changed by degrees, and it became more stony and seemed strewn with conglomerate and pieces of, of basalt with a sprinkling of lava. I thought that a mountainous region was succeeding the long plains, and accordingly, after a few evolutions of the Nautilus, I saw the southerly horizon blocked by a high wall which seemed to close all exit. Its summit evidently passed the level of the ocean. It must be a continent, or at least an island, one of the Canaries or of the Cape Verde Islands. The bearings not being yet taken, perhaps designedly, I was ignorant of our exact position. In any case, such a wall seemed to me to mark the limits of that, Atlantis, of that Atlantis, of which we had in reality passed over only the smallest part. Much longer should I have remained at the window admiring the beauties of the sea and sky, but the panels closed. At this moment, the Nautilus arrived at the side of this high perpendicular wall. What would it do, I could not, de I could not guess. I returned to my room. It no longer moved. I laid myself down with the full intention of waking after a few hours sleep, but it was eight o'clock the next day when I entered the saloon. I looked at the manometer. It told me that the Nautilus was floating on the surface of the ocean. Besides, I heard steps on the platform. I went to the panel. It was open, but instead of broad daylight, as I expected, I was surrounded by profound darkness. Where were we? Was I mistaken? Was it still night? No, not a star was shining, and night has not that utter darkness. I knew not what to think, when a voice near me said, Is that you, Professor? Ah, Captain, I answered. Where are we? Underground, sir. Underground, I exclaimed, and the Nautilus floating still. It always floats. But I do not understand. Wait a few minutes, our lantern will be lit, and if you like light places, you will be satisfied. I stood on the platform and waited. The darkness was so complete that I could not even see Captain Nemo. But looking into the zenith exactly above my head, I seemed to catch an undecided gleam, a kind of twilight filling a circular hole. At this instant, the lantern was lit and its vividness dispelled the faint light. I closed my dazzled eyes for an instant and then looked again. The Nautilus was stationary, floating near a mountain which formed a sort of quay. The lake, then, supporting it, was a lake imprisoned by a circle of walls measuring two miles in diameter and six in circumference. Its level, the manometer showed, could only be the same as the outside level, for there must necessarily be a communication between the lake and the sea. The high partitions, leaning forward on their base, grew into a vaulted roof, bearing the shape of an immense funnel turned upside down, the height being about five or six hundred yards. At the summit was a circular orifice by which I had caught the slight gleam of light, evidently daylight. Where are we? I asked. In the very heart of an extinct volcano, the interior of which has been invaded by the sea after some great convulsion of the earth. Whilst you were sleeping, Professor, the Nautilus penetrated to this lagoon by a natural canal, which opens about ten yards beneath the surface of the ocean. This is its harbor of refuge, a sure, commodious and mysterious one, sheltered from all gales. Show me, if you can, on the coasts of any of your continents or islands a road which can give us such perfect refuge from all storms. Certainly, I replied, you are in safety here, Captain Nemo. Who could reach you in the heart of a volcano? But did I not see an opening at its summit? Yes, its crater, formerly filled with lava, vapor, and flames, and which now gives entrance to the life-giving air we breathe. But what is this volcanic mountain? It belongs to one of the numerous islands with which the sea is strewn, to vessels a simple sandbank, to us an immense cavern. Chance led me to discover it, and chance served me well. But what of, but of what use is this refuge, Captain? The Nautilus wants no port. 
No, sir, but it wants electricity to make it move, and the wherewithal to make electricity, sodium to feed the elements, coal from which to get the sodium, and a coal mine to supply the coal. And exactly on this spot, the sea covers entire forests embedded during the geological periods, now mineralized and transformed into coal. For me, they are an inexhaustible mine. Your men follow the trade of miners here, then, Captain. Exactly so. These mines extend under the waves like the mines of Newcastle. Here, in their diving dresses, pickaxe and shovel in hand, my men extract the coal, which I do not even ask from the mines of the earth. When I burn this combustible for the manufacture of sodium, the smoke escaping from the crater of the mountain gives it the appearance of a still active volcano. And we shall see your companions at work. No, this, not this time at least, for I am in a hurry to continue our submarine tour of the earth, so I shall content myself with drawing from the reserve of sodium I already possess. The time for loading is one day only, and we continue our voyage. So if you wish to go over the cavern and make the round of the lagoon, you must take advantage of today, Monsieur Aranax. I thanked the captain and went to look for my companions, who had not yet left their cabin. I invited them to follow me without saying where we were. They mounted the platform. Conceal, who was astonished at nothing, seemed to look upon it as quite natural that he should wake under a mountain after having fallen asleep under the waves. But Ned Land thought nothing but finding whether the cavern had any exit. After breakfast, about ten o'clock, we went down on the mountain. Here we are, once more on land. Here we are, once more on land, said Conceal. I do not call this land, said the Canadian, and besides, we are not on it, but beneath it. Between the walls of the mountains and the waters of the lake lay a sandy shore, which, at its greatest breadth, measured five hundred feet. On this soil one might easily make the tour of the lake, but the base of the high partitions was stony ground, with volcanic locks and enormous uh, pumice stones lying in picturesque heaps. All these detached masses, covered with enamel, polished by the action of the subterraneous fires, shone resplendent by the light of our electric lantern. The mica dust from the shore, rising under our feet, flew like a cloud of sparks. The bottom now rose sensibly, and we soon arrived at long circuitous slopes, or inclined planes, which took us higher by degrees. But we were obliged to walk carefully among these conglomerates, bound by no cement, the feet slipping on the glassy, crystal, felsparred quartz. The volcanic nature of this enormous excavation was confirmed on all sides, and I pointed it out to my companions. Picture to yourselves, said I, what this crater must have been when filled with boiling lava, and when the level of the incandescent liquid rose to the orifice of the mountain, as though melted on top of a hot plate. I can picture it perfectly, said Conceal, but sir, will you tell me by... Tell me why the great architect has suspended operations and how it is that the furnace is replaced by the quiet waters of the lake. Most probably, Conceal, because some convulsion beneath the ocean produced that very opening which has served as a passage for the Nautilus. Then the waters of the Atlantic rushed into the interior of the mountain. There must have been a terrible struggle between the two elements, a struggle with which ended in the victory of Neptune. But many ages have run out since then, and the submerged volcano is now a peaceable grotto. Very well, replied Ned Land. I accept the explanation, sir, but in our own interests, I regret that the opening of which you speak was not made above the level of the sea. But friend Ned, said Conceal, if the passage has not been under the sea, the Nautilus could have not gone through it. We continued ascending. The steps became more and more perpendicular and narrow. Deep excavations, which we were obliged to cross, cut them here and there. Sloping masses had to be turned. We slid upon our knees and crawled along. But Conceal's dexterity and the Canadian's strength surmounted all obstacles. At a height of about 31 feet, the nature of the ground changed without becoming more practicable. To the conglomerate and trachyte uh, succeeded black basalt. The first dispread in layers of full in layers full of bubbles. Excuse me. The latter forming regular prisms, placed like a colonnade supporting the spring of the immense vault. An admirable specimen of natural architecture. Between the bolts, uh, the blocks of basalt wound long streams of lava, long since grown cold and crusted with bituminous rays. 
and in some places there were spread large carpets of sulfur. A more powerful light shone through the upper crater, shedding a vague glimmer over these volcanic depressions, forever buried in the bosom of this extinguished mountain. But our upward march was soon stopped at a height of about 250 feet by impassable obstacles. There was a complete vaulted arch overhanging us, and our ascent was changed to a circular walk. At the last change, vegetable life began to struggle with the mineral. Some shrubs and even some trees grew from the fractures of the walls. I recognized some euphorbias with the caustic sugar coming from them. Heliotropes, quite incapable of justifying their name, sadly drooped their clusters of flowers, both their color and perfume half gone. Here and there, some chrysanthemums grew timidly at the foot of an aloe with long, sickly-looking leaves. But between the streams of lava, I saw some little violets still slightly perfumed, and I admit that I smelt them with delight. Perfume in the soul of the flower and sea flowers have no soul. We had arrived at, foot, uh, at the foot of some sturdy dragon trees, which had pushed aside the rocks with their strong roots, when Ned Land exclaimed, Ah, sir, a hive, a hive! A hive, I replied with a gesture of incredulity. Yes, a hive, repeated the Canadian, and bees humming round it. I approached and was bound to believe my own eyes. There at a hole bored in one of the dragon trees were some thousands of these ingenious insects so common in all the canaries and whose produce is so much esteemed. Naturally enough, the Canadian wished to gather the honey, and I could not well oppose his wish. A quantity of dry leaves mixed with sulfur, he lit with a spark from his flint, and he began to smoke out the bees. The humming ceased by degrees, and the hive eventually yielded several pounds of the sweetest honey with which Ned Land filled his haversack. When I have mixed this honey with a paste of the breadfruit, said he, I shall be able to offer you a succulent cake. Oh, we have a transcriber's note. Breadfruit has been substituted for artocarpus in this edition. I don't know if we know what that is. Might have to look that up later. All right. Upon my word, said Conceal, it will be gingerbread. Never mind the gingerbread, said I. Let us continue our interesting walk. At every turn of the path we were following, the lake appeared in all its length and breadth. The lantern lit up the whole of its peaceable service, surface, which knew neither ripple nor wave. The Nautilus remained perfectly immovable. On the platform and on the mountain, the ship's crew were working like black shadows clearly carved against the luminous atmosphere. We were now going round the highest crest of the first layers of rock, which upheld the roof. I then saw that bees were not the only representatives of the animal kingdom in the interior of this volcano. Birds of prey hovered here and there in the shadows or fled from their nests on the top of the rocks. There were sparrow hawks with white breasts and kestrels, and down the slope scampered with their long legs several fine fat bustards. I leave anyone to imagine the covetousness of the Canadian at the sight of this savory game, and whether he did not regret having no gun. But he did his best to replace the stone, the lead by stones, and after several fruitless attempts, he succeeded in wounding a magnificent bird. To say that he risked his life twenty times before reaching it is but the truth. But he managed so well that the creature joined the honey cakes in his bag. We were now obliged to descend toward the shore, the crest becoming impracticable. Above us, the crater seemed to gape like the mouth of a well. From this place, the sky could be clearly seen, and the clouds dissipated by the west wind, leaving behind them, even on the summit of the mountain, their misty remnants, certain proof that they were only moderately high, for the volcano did not rise more than 800 feet above the level of the ocean. Half an hour after the Canadian's last exploit, we had regained the inner shore. Here the flora was represented by large carpets of marine crystal, a little umbelliferous plant, very good to pickle, which also bears the name of pierce stone and sea fennel. Conceal gathered some bundles of it. As to the fauna, it might be counted by thousands of crustacea of all sorts, lobsters, crabs, spider crabs, chameleon shrimps, and a large number of shells, rockfish, and limpets. Three quarters of an hour later, we had finished our circuitous walk and were on board. The crew had just finished loading the sodium, and the Nautilus could have left that instance. 
But Captain Nemo gave no order. Did he wish to wait until night and leave the submarine passage secretly? Perhaps so. Whatever it might be, the next day the Nautilus, having left its port, steered clear of all land at a few yards beneath the waves of the Atlantic. All right, we'll continue on to chapter 11, the Sargasso, Sargasso, Sargasso Sea. Get some water real quick. That day, the Nautilus crossed a singular part of the Atlantic Ocean. No one can be ignorant of the existence of a current of warm water known by the name of the Gulf Stream. After leaving the Gulf of Florida, we went into the direction of Spitsbergen. But before entering the Gulf of Mexico, about 45 degrees of northern latitude, the, this current divides into two arms, the principal one going towards the coast of Ireland and Norway, whilst the second bends to the south, about the height of the Azores. Then, touching the African shore and describing a lengthened oval, returns to the Antilles. This second arm, it is rather a collar than an arm, surrounds with its circles of warm water that portion of the cold, quiet, immovable ocean called the Sargasso Sea, a perfect lake in the open Atlantic. It takes no less than three years for the great current to pass round it. Such was the region the Nautilus was now visiting, a perfect meadow, a close carpet of seaweed, fucus, and tropical berries, so thick and so compact that the stem of the vessel could hardly tear its way through. And Captain Nemo, not wishing to entangle his screw in this herbaceous mass, kept some yards beneath the surface of the waves. The name Sargasso comes from the Spanish word Sargazzo, which signifies kelp. This kelp, or berry plant, is the principal formation of this immense bank. And this is the reason why these plants unite in the peaceful basin of the Atlantic. The only explanation which can be given, he says, seems to me to result from the experience known to all the world. Place in a vase some fragments of cork or other floating body and give to the water in the vase a circular movement. The scattered fragments will unite in a group in the, central, in the center of the liquid surface, that is to say, in the part least agitated. In the phenomenon we are considering, the Atlantic is the vase, the Gulf Stream, the circular current, and the Sargasso Sea, the central point at which the floating bodies unite. I share Mari's opinion, and I was able to study the phenomenon in the very midst where vessels rarely penetrate. Above us floated products of all kinds, heaped up among these brownish plants, trunks of trees torn from the Andes or the Rocky Mountains, and floated by the Amazon or the Mississippi. Mississippi. Numerous wrecks, remains of keels or ships' bottoms, side planks stove in, and so weighted with shells and barnacles that they could not again rise to the surface. And time will one day justify Mari's other opinion that these substances, thus accumulated for ages, will become petrified by the action of the water and will then form inexhaustible coal mines, a precious reserve prepared by far-seeing nature for the moment when men shall have exhausted the mines of continents. In the midst of this inextricable mass of plants and seaweed, I noticed some charming pink halcyons and actini, with their long tentacles trailing after them, and medusae, red, green, and blue. All the day of the 22nd of February, we passed in the Sargasso Sea, where such fish are, as are partial to marine plants find abundant nourishment. The next, the ocean had returned to its accustomed aspect. From the time for 19 days, from the 23rd of February to the 12th of March, the Nautilus kept in the middle of the Atlantic, carrying us at a constant speed of 100 leagues in 24 hours. Captain Nemo evidently intended accomplishing his submarine program, and I imagine that he intended, after doubling Cape Horn, to return to the Australian seas of the Pacific. Ned Land had cause for fear. In these large seas, void of islands, we could not attempt to leave the boat, nor had we any means of opposing Captain Nemo's will. Our only course was to submit, but what we could neither gain by force nor cunning, I like to think might be obtained by persuasion. This voyage ended, would he not consent to restore our liberty under an oath never to reveal his existence, an oath of honor which we should have religiously kept? 
But we must consider that delicate question with the captain. But was I free to claim this liberty? Had he not himself said from the beginning, in the firmest manner, that the secret of his life exacted from him our lasting imprisonment on board the Nautilus? And would not my four months' silence appear to him a tacit acceptance of our situation? And would not a return to the subject result in raising suspicions, which might be hurtful to our projects, if at some future time a favorable opportunity offered to return to them? During the 19 days mentioned above, no incident of any kind happened to signalize my, our voyage. I saw little of the captain. He was at work. In the library, I often found his books left open, especially those on natural history. My work on submarine depths, conned over by him, was covered with marginal notes, often contradicting my theories and systems. But the captain contented himself with thus purging my work. It was very rare for him to discuss it with me. Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes I heard the melancholy tones of his organ, but only at night and in the midst of the deepest obscurity when the Nautilus slept upon the deserted ocean. During this part of our voyage, we sailed whole days on the surface of the waves. The sea seemed abandoned. A few sailing vessels on the road to India were making for the Cape of Good Hope. One day we were followed by the boats of a whaler who, no doubt, took us for some enormous whale of great price, but Captain Nemo did not wish the worthy fellows to lose their time and trouble, so ended the chase by plunging under the water. Our navigation continued until the 13th of March. That day the Nautilus was employed in taking soundings, which greatly in interested me. We had then made about 13,000 leagues since our departure from the high seas of the Pacific. The bearings gave us a 45 degrees and 37 degrees southerly latitude and 37 to 53 degrees western longitude. It was the same water in which Captain Dinham of the Herald sounded 7,000 fathoms without finding the bottom. There, too, Lieutenant Parker of the American Frigate Congress could not touch the bottom with 15,140 fathoms. Captain Nemo intended seeking the bottom of the ocean by a diag diagonal sufficiently lengthened by means of lateral planes placed at an angle of 45 degrees with the waterline of the Nautilus. Then the screw set to work at its maximum speed, its four blades beating the waves with in indescribable force. Under this powerful pressure, the hull of the Nautilus quivered like a sonorous cord and sank regularly under the water. At 7,000 fathoms, I saw some blackish tops rising from the midst of the waters, but these summits might belong to high mountains like the Himalayas or Mount Blanc, even higher, and the depth of the abyss remained incalculable. The Nautilus descended still lower in spite of the great pressure. I felt the steel plates tremble at the fastening of the bolts, its bars bent, its partitions groaned. The windows of the saloon seemed to curve under the pressure of the waters. And this firm structure would doubtless have yielded if, as the captain had said, it had not been capable of resistance like a solid block. We had attained a depth of 16,000 yards, or four leagues, and the sides of the Nautilus then bore a pressure of 1,600 atmospheres, that is to say, 3,200 pounds to each square two-fifths of an inch of its surface. What a situation to be in, I exclaimed, to overrun these depths, these deep regions where man has never trod. Look, Captain, look at these magnificent rocks, these uninhabited grottoes, these lowest receptacles of the globe, where life is no longer possible. What unknown sights are here? Why should we be unable to preserve a remembrance of them? Would you like to carry away more than the remembrance, said Captain Nemo? What do you mean by those words? I mean to say that nothing is easier than to make a photographic view of this submarine region. I had not time to express my surprise at this new proposition when, at Captain Nemo's call, an objective was brought into the saloon. Through the widely opened panel, the liquid mass was bright with electricity, which was distributed with such uniformity that not a shadow, not a gradation, was to be seen in our manufactured light. The Nautilus remained motionless, the force of its screw subdued by the inclination of its planes. The instrument was propped on the bottom of the oceanic site, and in a few seconds we had obtained a perfect negative. But the operation being over, Captain Nemo said, Let us go up. We must not abuse our position, nor expose the Nautilus too long to such great pressure. 
go up again, I exclaimed. Hold well on. I had not time to understand why the captain cautioned me thus when I was thrown forward onto the carpet at a signal from the captain that screw was shipped and its blaze raised vertically. The nautilus shot into the air like a balloon rising with stunning rapidity and cutting the mass of waters with a sonorous agitation. Nothing was visible and in four minutes it had shot through the four leagues which separated it from the ocean and after emerging like a flying fish fell, making the waves rebound to an enormous height. Okay, we'll go for another five minutes. Here we go. Chapter uh, 12, Cachalots of Wales. During the nights of the 13th and 14th of March, the Nautilus returned to its southerly course. I fancied that, when on a level with Cape Horn, he would return the helm westward in order to beat the Pacific seas and so complete the tour of the world. He did nothing of the kind but continued on his way to the southern regions. Where was he going to? To the pole? It was madness. I began to think that the captain's temerity, temerity justified Ned Land's fears. For some time past, the Canadian had not spoken to me of his projects of flight. He was less communicative, almost silent. I could see that this lengthened imprisonment was weighing upon him, and I felt that rage was burning within him. When he met the captain, his eyes lit up with suppressed anger, and I feared that his natural violence would lead him into some extreme. That day, the 14th of March, Conceal and he came to me in my room. I inquired the cause of their visit. A simple question to ask you, sir, replied the Canadian. Speak, Ned. How many men are there on board the Nautilus, do you think? I cannot tell, my friend. I should say that its working does not require a large crew. Certainly, under existing conditions, ten men at the most ought to be enough. Well, why should there be any more? Why, I replied, looking fixedly at Ned Land, whose meaning was easy to guess. Because, I added, if my surmises are correct, and if I have well understood the captain's existence, the Nautilus is not only a vessel, it is also a place of refuge for those who, like the commander, have broken every tie upon earth. Perhaps so, said Conceal, but in any case, the Nautilus can only contain a certain number of men. Could not you, sir, estimate their maximum? How, Conceal? By calculation, given the size of the vessel, which you know, sir, and consequently the quantity of air it contains, knowing also how much each man, ex man expends at a breath, and comparing these results with the fact that the Nautilus is obliged to go to the surface every 24 hours. Conceal had not finished the sentence before I saw what he was driving at. I understand, said I, but that calculation, though simple enough, can give but a very uncertain result. Never mind, said Ned Land urgently. Here it is then, said I. In one hour, each man consumes the oxygen contained in 20 gallons of air, and in 24, that contained in 480 gallons. We must therefore find how many times 480 gallons of air the Nautilus contains. Just so, said Conceal, or, I continued, the size of the Nautilus being 1,500 tons and one ton holding 200 gallons, it contains 300,000 gallons of air, which, divided by 480, gives a quotient of 625, which means to say, strictly speaking, that the air contained in the Nautilus would suffice for 625 men for 24 hours. 625, repeated Ned, but remember that all of us, passengers, sailors, and officers included, would not form a tenth part of that number. Still too many for three men, murmured Conceal. The Canadian shook his head, passed his hand across his forehead, and left the room without answering. Will you allow me to make one observation, sir? said Conceal. Poor Ned is longing for everything that he cannot have. His past life is always present to him. Everything that we are forbidden he regrets. His head is full of old recollections, and we must understand him. What has he to do here? Nothing. He is not learned like you, sir, and has not the same taste for the beauties of the sea that we have. He would risk everything to, go, to be able to go once more into a tavern in his own country. Certainly the monotony on board must seem intolerable to the Canadian, accustomed as he was to a life of liberty and activity. Events were rare which could rouse him to any show of spirit, but that day an event did happen which recalled the bright days of the harpooner. 
About 11 in the morning, being on the surface of the ocean, the Nautilus fell in with a troop of whales, an encounter which did not astonish me, knowing that these creatures, hunted to death, had taken refuge in high latitudes. We were seated on the platform with a quiet sea. The month of October in those latitudes gave us some lovely autumnal days. It was the Canadian, he could not be mistaken, who signaled a whale on the eastern horizon. Looking attentively, one might see its black back rise and fall with the waves five miles from the Nautilus. We'll have to end there today. So I will have us bookmarked there. All right, so um, as today is Thursday, we will be back uh, tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I'll remind you again tomorrow, but we won't have a reading on Memorial Day, as we'll have that uh, day off here. And I, and I hope you will have a nice Memorial Day as well. Um, but please do join us at 2 p.m. today, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, for our Weapons Through the Ages with historian Glenn Kyle. Uh, that's going to be a really fun event. And... Um, I also wanted to, again, remind you of our digital memberships that begin next week. Um, our first digital program is going to be um, with poet and spoken word artist Shiara Richardson. Um, if you saw our Harriet Tubman um, live stream, that is Shiara Richardson. So she is a phenomenal living history interpreter, but also um, a, a poet and a, an educator. So she is going to do a live stream uh, presentation on black poetry in America and, uh, and also give a lesson in how to write poetry. So if you've ever been interested or curious about how to write poetry, where do you even begin, you'll get a lesson um, on some history of black poetry and then a lesson in how to write poetry uh, from Shiara herself. So really looking forward to that um, next Friday, the 27th, I believe. Is that the 27th? <laughs> uh, let, me, let me check my dates there. Uh, the 29th, excuse me. So that's next Friday, the 29th. And uh, so please join us as a digital member. You can join for as low as $3.00 a month or 25 for the year. I'm going to put a link in the chat for you to visit. And um, yeah, I just encourage you to become a digital member. So until tomorrow, or hopefully I'll see you this afternoon, please take care. And I'll see you again uh, tomorrow for sure at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm.